This is the Focus Odin 5 F3 3D printer. It is widely known as the folding 3D printer and it was Focus's first foray into the 3D printing market. This right here is Focus's brand new Kickstarter 3D printer, the Odin Smart. Now, why should you care about this printer? Is it better than this guy? And should you be backing this one on Kickstarter? That's what I'm gonna be talking about right here today on Curzy Fabrications. Let's get going. Hey guys, did you know on this channel, 3D printer manufacturers cannot and do not pay for these reviews. That's why I really appreciate companies like this that sponsor these videos. PCB Way, it's a fantastic company that is basically your one-stop shop for producing anything that you can. So whether it be the PCB prototyping, PCB assembly, 3D printing, CNCing, whatever you need made, I bet you that they can help you out with it. Right now they are running a fantastic deal on four layer and six layer PCBs. They've dropped the price up to 20% on those. So if you've been thinking about producing your own PCB, again, if you have something you can't 3D print yourself or you can't CNC yourself, give these guys a look on their website. Again, fantastic company. I've used them myself. You should check out PCB Way for all of these different services. Thanks to them for sponsoring this video. Now let's start the review. So let's start out by talking about the company Focus and their original Odin 5F3 printer. Now I was first introduced to Focus about 10 months ago when I received an email to take a look at this printer. And I did a live stream unboxing it and doing a test print on it back in November of 2021. Now since then, I haven't used it a whole lot, but I have pulled it back out and done a few more test prints on it. And I have to say, I'm overall very pleased with how it prints and just how easy it is to use. It's easy to assemble and the prints just work on this machine. I've had very little problems. And just to back that up, I wanted to take a look at how this printer and how the company was doing in the community. So I started out on Amazon and took a look at the reviews of this printer to see how it was doing with the general public that had purchased it. Overall, it's doing really good for an Amazon printer as a 4.3 out of 5 rating, which is fantastic given the different kinds of people that are going to buy it through Amazon. I also took a look at the official community that's available on Facebook, and again, overall, the community is very happy with not only the printer, but also the service that they have been able to receive online. Our good friend Dora over there, who is also my contact for this company, has just been fantastic answering questions, making sure that firmware gets released to the right people and just does her very best to make sure that the company has a very good image online and they are supporting their customers. So kudos to them. So let's start out by taking a look at these two machines side by side. Let's find out why they're similar and what makes them different. So first of all, as you can see, they are both standard bed slinger designs. They have a 235 by 235 by 250 build volume pretty standard for machines in this class. They both are direct drive extruders, which is pretty nice because that's going to open up your possibilities when it comes to different types of filament that you are gonna be able to print with, meaning you're gonna be able to print with those softer filaments like TPU. Now, while they are similar in design, the hot ends are not identical. They have a slightly different design in terms of the way that they feed filament. They definitely have a different melt zone. While this one has a volcano style hot end with a extra long melt zone, this one opted for a more traditional size hot end, which depending on how fast you want to print may not be such a bad thing. And it will make it a little easier for you to find nozzles. Although these days that's not too big of a deal. The cooling on these are also a little bit different. While this one has a nice directed shroud that puts the cooling right at the tip of the nozzle, this one has more of an open cooling design where the fan just kind of blows in the direction of the actual hot end. And while that's not a huge deal, there are situations where the cooling may not be quite as good, but overall in my prints, I really didn't notice any problems with cooling on either machine. They're not stellar cooling because they're only blowing from one side, but overall not too upset with either one of these. Taking a look at the electronics of the machines, again, they are very similar machines. They both have 32-bit microprocessors at their core. This machine is running a maker base Robin Nano 
version 1.2 base board, again running the ST microprocessor running at 72 megahertz. While this guy over here, they have actually done their own board design. This is running a focus base board. This one has a slightly faster ST microprocessor running at 168 megahertz. Will that extra speed of the processor actually matter when you're printing with these machines? Well, at normal printing speeds, probably not. If you're doing 100 millimeters per second or less, I don't think you're gonna have a problem with either of those chips. Now, when you try to get up to the 300 millimeters per second, which is what both of these tout, that's where that extra speed may come in handy. So they've designed a new board, and overall though, the electronics are still pretty much the same. They have the same Marlin firmware, although, while the displays on here are very similar and may even be running the same technology, they are running a different user interface. Do I like this one better than this one or vice versa? Not really. It's a pretty standard touch interface. This one is still under a little bit of development because they're still taking feedback from the community. Overall though, again, not too much different in the actual interface. Now let's go ahead and talk about a couple of the other differences between the machines. Over here on the Odin 5, they have a Z access motor on each side of the X gantry. That means that there's an active drive on both sides supporting the X gantry. Over here on the new Odin Smart, they opted for a single Z drive motor and then a belt between each of the screws. Now, one thing I like about this is that both sides are still supported by a screw but there isn't a motor driving both sides. Now, this is great for synchronization, and actually some printers will actually have both Z motors and the belt drive to keep everything synchronized and keep any side from falling one way or the other. But over here, the way that it's done, I ended up having to do some tweaking and adjusting when I first got this printer so that this belt on top was the right tension, otherwise it wasn't doing any good. So, I think what they've done over here is okay. There may be a little calibration that has to be done when you first get this out of the box to make sure that that belt is tightened correctly. But overall, it's all right. And like I said, since they at least put a screw on both sides, at least it's being supported on both sides. Now, obviously one of the big selling points of this machine is that it will hook up to the internet. You can monitor it and you can actually do time lapses of your prints. Now all of that is accomplished through a separate microprocessor that is in this gray box right here and I'm going to show you a clip of exactly what that looks like. Now what they've done is they've taken a controller that is specifically designed for an IP camera so that you can hook up over Wi-Fi and monitor a camera which is down here in this area here and that will look at your print as it goes up. Now, it does a good job. I've had zero problems connecting to my Wi-Fi, and I've actually had no problems installing their app, which we'll talk about in a minute. In fact, there's even a little light on here in case it gets dark, that comes on automatically. It's not the best solution because I couldn't find a manual way of turning on that light, and obviously you end up with kind of different dynamic lighting conditions depending on what the room is, and so, it doesn't always adjust to night vision the way it should, but I do like a light better than actual night vision because it means I get better video than if I was relying on a traditional night vision view, which isn't going to have colors and everything like that. So overall, this is a good solution. It does present a interesting set of issues though because this controller is not the same thing as the controller in the bottom of this printer. And so what there is, is there's communication going on between this processor and this processor. It means that at least for right now, and if they fix this later, they'll have to let people know it, but at least for right now, it means that if you wanna print from the app, if you wanna do the time lapses, it means that you have to use the micro SD card that is in this controller up here. But if you want to print traditionally, you have to use the USB card, which is in the bottom of the printer down here. It presents a little bit of confusion because now you have to care where you put your files if you're going to be printing direct from the printer or if you're going to be printing from the card up here. And they just, you can't do 
both at the same time. This will not communicate with this, and this will not communicate with this, at least as far as the interfaces are concerned. Uh, again, I think this is something they're trying to fix, that they're trying to work on, but at time of filming, that was something that was not working. Now, one important note is, is that you actually can still monitor your print via the camera, even if you're printing from down here, and the app does know that the printing is going on, but you just don't have the control and it won't do the time lapses if you're printing from here. So some functionality still, but just not the full suite as if you were printing directly from the app. Now let's talk about the app just for a minute. So I installed the app directly from the Google Play Store, no problems at all there, installed without any issues. Of course you're going to need to give it various permissions to your phone, just like you would any app. They all seem perfectly reasonable to me, given what the app was doing. Now, when you install the app, you're going to set up all of your settings. That is outlined in the manual. I had zero problems following their directions to get that set up. And when you log into the app, you are going to be presented with a screen that wants your information. Obviously, you're going to be connecting to their application in the cloud to be able to monitor this wherever you are. There has to be some sort of connection there. And in fact, there is no direct connection to the printer in case you wanted to use it without the app. This is an app camera that you will need to actually have the app installed to be able to use. Now for basic functionality, there is not gonna be a subscription is what I'm being told by Focus. In fact, you only need a subscription if you want to be able to store your time lapses on their cloud. That being said, as long as you download your last time lapse before the next time lapse, there's no problem keeping those on your local device. It shows up, you can do a download, and then from what I've been told, just the older time lapses beyond maybe the last one, maybe a couple, I'm not exactly sure what they're gonna settle on, will be available to you so you can download it and you're good to go. So now that I've spent most of the video talking about the company, talking about this original machine, what you can expect from this machine, let me get to the nuts and bolts of this review and tell you about my experience with it. First of all, out of the box, the experience with unboxing this machine was almost the same as unboxing this one, meaning they went with the whole folding design again, four screws assembled, ready to go. Really the only thing I had to bring to the party was a machinist square so that I was really happy with how the machine was squared off, but again, that was me and not necessary for the whole process. There was a couple of other things I had to adjust on this machine. I did have to come in and as I mentioned, I had to tighten this top belt. The L brackets that are up here needed some adjustment for that to be properly tensioned. And I also had to go around and there were just some other screws that needed just a little bit of tightening. Uh, it was something that I've become accustomed to, unboxing printers. You just need to go around with the wrenches that it comes with and make sure all your screws are tightened up and make sure that, for example, all of your wheels are at the proper tension. Again, if you don't do it, you're gonna notice artifacts, you're gonna notice some other problems with your printing. Uh, and so it's just a good idea to do that right out of the box. Once everything was finally set up, I went straight to printing. First thing I did, of course, was get this all configured and I got my cell phone talking to the new processor in this machine. And as I mentioned earlier, it went very well. I had no problems connecting it. It took two times for me to properly pair it. But again, it wasn't confusing. It just didn't work the first time. And then I just tried again, had no problems. From there, I did find out about how the firmware upgrade process was on here because I think that's going to happen a lot. They are actively working on the development of this machine, and so there may be some firmware downloads once you have yours. Now, for the actual processor that runs the machine down here in the base, you end up having to put a file on the USB drive. It's very simple. You put that file on there, turn it on, it flashes, you're good to go. Up here, all of these are over the air upgrades, meaning you can upgrade this firmware from the app without any problems. I found that process to be extremely easy. As long as you know where to go to in the app, the upgrade is very easy. It goes through the whole process. Just let your phone sit there until it's completed and it's all done and you have the latest firmware, you're ready to go. Now let's move on to talking about all of these test prints I have on the table. I'll explain to you why I have a graveyard here and while I have a pile over here of mostly good prints. So when I started to run test prints on this printer, I immediately turned to my Polymaker PolyLite PLA Pro 
for my test filament. It's a good solid filament. I've printed it on other printers without any problems. And so I turn to their test print, which is an oversized Benchy, which was supposed to print at the target speed of 300 millimeters per second. And as you can see down here, it ended up in a Benchy graveyard of print after print, failing in different ways, but ultimately not succeeding. So after talking to focus about the problems, I then turned to trying to print with their sample spool of filament that the printer came with. I usually avoid that because it's not usually the highest quality filament. And so I usually try to go with a known quantity to actually show the best performance of the printer by printing with higher quality filament. But as it turns out, they had pretty much already tuned this printer and those profiles and test prints to work with that filament. So when I finally did that, I ended up with the Benchy that they expected. Now, this Benchy isn't the best quality. You'll see that there's missed extrusions and things are sometimes a little thin on the deck. So I contacted them again about it. They started talking to me about finding the proper tension on the extruder. Now that's an odd thing to do because usually once you've assembled the extruder, it's pretty much in the proper format. It should be set up to print the way that it was built to print. Sometimes you'll have little screws on here, little finger screws that will allow you to change the tension, but we don't have that on this printer. And what they had me do was actually unscrew the entire unit and there's a little bit of play in the extruder. You can screw it down a little to the right, a little to the left, front and back of the printer respectively. That's not a great thing because if you have a mechanical device, you don't want that much play in it where you could actually have an assembly that's not quite right to do the job properly. But I did what they said and with a little bit more tensioning, I actually did end up with a Benchy that is probably what they expected and it looks really good. There's a little bit of overhang issues as we get to the bottom of this and there is some ringing around the cabin because we're printing so fast and apparently our accelerations are not set up that great. But we did get a Benchy to print. And then after that, I was able to go on and try to print these Benchies again. And as you can see, I was able to end up with a rough looking Benchy <laughs> printed in the filament that I was trying to print with. And as you can see, this thing looks like a ghost Benchy. It is in pretty rough shape. Now I did again what they said. I went in there, started playing with the tension again, and I got a better Benchy. It's not quite the ghost Benchy. It's got a little bit of problems in the hull, but this one, it's acceptable, I guess, for printing at 300, but I'm not happy with it. This isn't what I would print on this printer. I wouldn't keep printing with those profiles or those speeds if I had that problem. And just to underscore what else I was seeing, I again printed this test print, which was also on the USB. And again, it printed pretty good. I was able to get some of these tolerance pegs to remove up to the 0.4, but the 0.3 and 0.2 are stuck. Um, and there was some stringing around these points here. Pay no attention to the broken ones here. That was because I wasn't quite careful enough with these. Now, again, when I switched over to the Polymaker, I got a little bit less tolerance uh, and it wouldn't really come out on that point four at this point. Uh, overhangs look pretty good, but I've got really thin walls. It wasn't able to push out that filament fast enough. Oh, and I forgot to note, I did increase the temperature on these to compensate for the fact that it was a little bit higher quality filament that needed more temperature to print. No matter how much I increased the temperature of that filament though, it still really couldn't push it out to the point where I increased it and realized I had gone too far. These are just some of the best examples. Now, once I was sure that it could print at the proper temperatures, I left that filament in and tried some other test prints. Now, I went on to print this E cup. Now this is an energy cup. You'll recognize it probably from Mega Man. Uh, links in the description to any of these models that I've used. And this one again, it printed. It printed acceptably, 
but there are issues, uh, overhang issues around the lip of the cup, and there are some, again, thin layer issues, particularly in the bottom of the cup. It just didn't work out well. It's not the best print. Again, these are printed using their normal profile, which is at 300 millimeters per second, but not at their fastest speed. They did include three different profiles for me to try, a slower, a normal, and a fast. I never got up to the fast, and the slow wasn't really that much slower, at least in terms of practical printing speeds. Now, I tried with other filament. So this is with a filament one filament, and well, as you can see, printing fast is not all it's cracked up to be. This one did finish, but it knocked off the handle in the process, and it's extremely uh, just covered in hair. It's, it's got hair all over the place. It has stringing in the filament, more than you could really clean off, uh, and the extrusions on the inside just don't look any better. So again, two higher quality filaments just really couldn't print that fast. And as you can see, I even tried to print some other small benchies, and printing smaller did not help it. In fact, it made it worse, and all of these ended up coming off the build plate at some point because the build plate wasn't sticking well enough and I ended up with even more Benchy Graveyards. And just to see if their filament would do any better at this, I did try to print it in their filament, but I had layer shifting as you can see and that didn't help out a whole lot either. Now, since I did have some success with this cup, I wanted to see can I print any other larger items at those top speeds and Look at there, I did. This is a glasses case from Clockspring 3D. It's a print in place part. Notice it did print the whole thing. There's a little bit of stringing on here, but it's not too bad. But as I mentioned, it's a print in place item. It should be able to close and um, didn't work so good. This is printed in Polymaker, their regular Polylite PLA, and it printed well, but printing at high speeds when you need something to move and you need something precise and you need it to cool properly is not a particularly good idea. So printing at those high speeds with this resulted in a reasonably nice print. All the actual surfaces look pretty good, but it resulted in a print that was not functional. So after all of that, I did just wanna see what can this printer do if I slow it down, print at quote unquote normal printing speeds, 50 millimeters per second, and <laughs> that's where this beauty came from. I printed this tower. It looks fantastic. The filament I chose is this Strong Hero Mirror Chrome PLA Wizard Voodoo Purple Blue, and that's why I kept it up here because I knew I was going to have to read that to remember what it said. But as you can see, it's a beautiful print. The walls look great, all of the layering looks fantastic, and yeah, I know, it's a glitter filament, it's a mirror filament, it hides some of the layers and some of the defects, but that's okay. It printed really nice, and I can tell by looking at it closely that it did print well all over. The printer had no problems getting this out. And, again, to show that it could print flexibles, I did two different flexibles here, this being the softer of the two, I don't have the shore hardness in front of me, but they both printed really nice. I've got two Flexi Octopuses here, and they printed really, really good. This one's a little holy over here, but I think that was because I was using some old TPU, which is why I printed the second one. So to let you know, these were printed, particularly the test prints, were printed in a combination of using the SD card and using the app, and using the USB card and printing directly off of the board. But I've got these to show also. As you can see, this is actually a start of this print. This is the start of another print that I never was able to finish. And these were using the SD card and time-lapse. I did find out that under certain prints with the current firmware that is on this part, sometimes the time lapses would fail. It would get to a layer, and instead of going over, taking a snapshot like it was supposed to, it would just stop, and the print would just fail where it sat, and that's what happened to both of those. 
Now, I do know that they are continuing to work on this. I have sent them G-code files, and there's even a new firmware waiting on me as I film this video. But unfortunately, I couldn't wait to film this review forever. And so that's what you've got here. They are still working on this bug. I'll be happy to post an update on social media and in the comments if I actually get one that will print everything all the way through. So when it came time to print this one, the one that's on here, that one did come off the USB stick. So the SD card could not print it at this time. So that is a ton of information. So I'm gonna give you my opinion of this Odin Smart versus the Odin 5 and tell you what I really think of this new machine versus the old one and tell you which printer I think you should buy. All right, now that both of these machines are back on the table, let's talk about my opinions. So speed, it dominated a large portion of my review section of this video and with good reason. This printer is being sold as a 300 millimeter per second printer. You'll see it a lot in their marketing material. You'll see it on their website. And you also see it in the profiles that they provide with this printer. Now, there's a problem with speed and 3D printing. It's not easy. And just because you get a profile that works with this machine, on this model, with this filament, it doesn't mean it's going to work on all of those things. Which model you're printing matters. Which filament you're printing with matters. The cooling of the machine matters. Not every filament, not every model can be printed that fast, at least not with a lot of time and care being paid to printing settings. That's my only problem with a machine like this marketing that 300 millimeter per second speed is sure. We've shown that you can get that kind of print speeds on certain models when the printer is printing just perfectly. But as I've shown in plenty of other examples, that 300 millimeters per second is not going to be obtainable without a lot of tweaking. And let's be honest, if all of the parts of the printer are working perfectly. As I showed, there are some problems with the extruder on this machine when trying to print really quickly. There's some tolerance issues built into that extruder that can throw it out of whack just a little bit, and they were asking me to tighten up those tolerances. And I actually found that if those tolerances got too tight, that getting the filament to feed began to be a real big issue, and I couldn't actually get the filament to feed properly, and it was a huge problem. Now, if we get away from the speed component of this printer and we look at just treating it like any other bed slinging printer, we find that it does a fine job. We find that it does a job similar to its other Odin 5 brother cousin here and that we get really good looking prints out of it and we even get good looking flexible prints due to that direct drive extruder. And I actually don't think those tolerances that I've talked about in the extruder are really going to matter when printing at those slower speeds. You're not going to have skipping, you're not gonna be missing a step if you're not trying to push that filament through that nozzle too quickly. Now, if we look at the other features being marketed on this printer, the ones that are in this part of the printer, the camera, the remote monitoring, and the remote control, well, once they get that working just right, I think those features are gonna be pretty nice. Like I said, the app was rather intuitive. I didn't have any problems installing it. I didn't have any real issues connecting this to my network. So I can say with confidence, if they get the bugs worked out, particularly in the time-lapse portion of that software, I think that if that is something that you want in a printer, that those are going to be nice features to have. Now, keep in mind that the camera is stationary on this printer in terms of it's in this part of the printer, meaning if you wanted to get a different angle on it, that's not going to be something that's available to you. Again, it's right here, and if you look at the time lapses that I'm able to show you in this video, the ones that succeeded, you'll see that sometimes you get good shots and sometimes you won't, but you'll always be the same distance away and that will be the shots that you're able to share with people. Now, those videos I was able to get off my phone, they worked just great, and as you can see here, they look fine. Now, it's, I believe, a 720p camera. 
I hope I'm right on that. If not, I'll put it down here at the bottom. Again, I think that that is just there to have something to show off a little bit on social media and overall just to be able to monitor and potentially see what happened with the print if something goes awry. You're not going to, again, be able to upgrade that component to get a vertical camera or to get a higher resolution video. Now let's look at the cost of the two printers real quick and then I want to put the cost of the machines in perspective to what you're getting in the Odin Smart. So in the original Odin 5, the retail price is $359.99. On the Focus website, you can get it for $289.99, making that retail price just kind of a number. And on Amazon, it's listed at that $359.99 as its retail price. But I've seen it two different times, one times with a coupon that would bring it down to $244.99. And then currently, at the time that I'm filming this video, you can get it with a 40% off coupon that brings it to $209.99. So that puts this machine at about the $210 price point, which with the 32-bit board, the dual Z axis, and the direct drive extruder is actually a really good price for this machine. I can say, if you can get it for that price, go for it. It's an excellent little machine. If you're looking for a machine with this build volume, I'm pretty happy with this machine. I think the cooling's good, and I think the overall print quality is justified in that price range. Now, the Kickstarter. Yes, I've said it a couple of times, but let me say it again. This currently is a Kickstarter printer. If you're gonna want one of the first printers off the line, you're gonna to need to go over to Kickstarter, give them your money, and then when the whole campaign is over with, you should get a printer. Now, I wanna preface that and be honest with you, Kickstarter is not a marketplace, meaning if you pay them money, you're not guaranteed to get whatever you pay them money for. And that is a general Kickstarter rule. You are helping to finance a project, you hope that if they meet their goals, they will deliver, and then they will deliver you your award for supporting them. Now, as far as Focus is concerned, just like what we've seen with other established 3D printer companies, your odds that they will deliver you a machine are really high, and I'm gonna be honest with you about that. Focus is an established company now. They've been selling a lot of these machines, and I do think that they have the capital in both money wise and both reputation wise that they should deliver this product if you back it. But again, it is Kickstarter. They're not guaranteed to deliver it. If I don't tell you that, then I would be not as honest as I should be. And I want to be honest with you here. Now, do I think that they're going to have this machine available after Kickstarter? Yes, I do. This machine's available, and as long as this machine sells well, as long as they think that they have a market for it after Kickstarter, think it'll be available after Kickstarter as well. So you may want to look out for it there. But I've digressed too long on Kickstarter, so let's talk about the prices there. So they're listing this retail price on Kickstarter for $559, which puts it $200 more retail price than this guy over here. Now, of course, it's a Kickstarter, and as we know, Kickstarter has levels that you can pay depending on how early you get in on this. Now, I've had this machine for a while, and I've been trying to work out the bugs, and so I apologize, but you're not going to get on, on the earliest and cheapest versions of this printer. They did have some early versions as low as $199 for this machine. And I have to be honest, at $199, that was to get people in and get them excited. They were probably losing money at the $199 price. Now, last time I checked, you should be able to get in at $359, but there are only 200 units at that price. So... If by the time you make your way over to Kickstarter and there aren't any 359 printers, I apologize. The next price up is going to be $399 and there are a thousand units available at $399. So most people will probably be able to get in at that price. So let's kind of break that down. So at $359, you're paying about $150 more for this machine than this one at $399, you're paying almost $200 more, which, let's be honest, looking at the retail price difference, they're probably expecting you to pay about $200 more for this machine than this one. I have to be honest with you. There is not $200 difference in these two machines. I mean, look at them. They have the same build volume. They have the same overall motion system. And in fact, as far as the motion system is concerned, this one over here has one less motor in it. So for $200, you're getting this component of the printer and the app on your cell phone. So what's that getting you? That's getting you remote monitoring and that's getting you time lapses 
for $200. And what you're paying there, I guess, as long as they don't charge you ever for the remote monitoring piece, maybe that's not a bad deal because they are giving you cloud access without an additional charge. But of course, for $200, you could decide to implement your own with a Raspberry Pi, which would give you the ability to move around your camera. It would give you any number of camera options if you wanted to upgrade to a higher quality. It would give you the control of Octoprint if that's what you wanted to install. So I think what I'm trying to say is if you're spending $200 more for this machine, you're doing it because you don't want to install your own version of a remote monitoring on it. You don't want to have to worry about how am I going to access this remotely. And so you're the kind of person that would rather spend that money for convenience rather than having to do it yourself. Now, if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. I just want you to go into it knowing that that's what you're paying for. Going back to the machines themselves, I want to remind you that on their website, they list this printer as being able to print 300 millimeters per second. So keep that in mind. There's nothing mechanically different here that separates this machine from this machine. There's no reason that if they say that this one can print 300 millimeters per second, that this one can't also. Now, as I mentioned, it's going to take tweaking. It's going to take special configuration to get it to do that for any variety of filament that you choose to print with. So keep that in mind. As for me, unless the printer's really designed for speed, like a Core XY machine, I'm going to keep in mind that it's probably better to print slower than faster, particularly if I care about the quality of my prints. And that is my overall opinion of these machines, is that this is a great machine if you can get it for that 209 price. Even if you can't and you have to spend a little bit more, this is a good machine. This machine over here, they've taken away some things. The extruder's not quite as tuned currently. And what you're paying for is cloud access, remote monitoring. So if that's what you need, then go for it. So with all of that being said, I hope you realize that I did my very best to put together my thoughts on these two machines. It was a pretty complicated review because I was definitely trying to go off of the fact that they were marketing this as an upgrade to this. And I really wanted to take a look at what they were trying to sell with this machine over this one and trying to represent that accurately. I do want to thank Focus for providing both of these machines for the purpose of this review. They provided them free of charge to me and no other money has exchanged hands for the purpose of this review. So thanks to them, you're getting to see this video about both of these machines. Now, if you have any further questions about my experiences with both of them, or if you want to know more about the machines as I move forward, as they release new firmware to me, and as I have more time to test them, please go down into the comments. Read the comments that I'm gonna be posting down there, read the questions other people have asked, and then if you don't see what you're looking for, please feel free to leave your question down below and I will do my very best to get to it, just like I do in the comments on all of my videos. Hey, if you're new here, I'm Chris, this is Curzy Fabrications. I do videos like this where I cover 3D printing as well as a whole bunch of other things such as prop building and fun things to do with your 3D printer. So if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. Join me here, join me on all other social medias as Curzy Fabs. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.